Okay, so everyone does, is aware that we are recording this session. And uh, like I said, we'll post this on our YouTube channel later. Uh, I am Chris Rutledge. I'm the VP of External Affairs at Friendship Place. I'm filling in for John Michelle today, who's off at a conference speaking. We do a lot of presentations, as you know, at Friendship Place. This is an opportunity to share the good news of the work we're doing and share information about our activities and engagements. Um, today, we're here to talk about our AIM Higher program. It's a very active, very vibrant program, and it really helps get people where they need to be in terms of securing employment and securing opportunity for down the road. We have David Vicente, who is a division director at AIM Higher, and he's going to speak uh, about the work here. Uh, as always, I have some questions that I'll ask at the end of David's presentation, but this is so much more vibrant and energizing if you all pose questions, because I can't know what is of interest to you, uh, and I'm sure there are things that are of interest to you. So please, as we go through, go ahead, drop questions in the chat or at the conclusion of uh, uh, David's speaking. We, we'll have the opportunity to uh, uh, maybe just unmute yourself. I'm going to mute everybody now except David um, so that we don't have a lot of uh, back chatter in the back there. I see again where people just joined. I'm going to mute now. Okay, David, I'm going to unmute you. Um, so you'll need to unmute yourself, David, to begin. Uh, David, we're going to throw to you right now. Um, we'll have some links we'll drop into the chat at the conclusion of things that are interesting. Hey, to but uh, uh, I'm going to yeah. mute. I'm going to mute everybody. I'm going to mute. I see. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. And let me just set, do the setting here. Mute. I do have mute entrance participants upon entry, so we shouldn't have much more people jumping in here. David, without further ado, why don't I just toss to you? David, over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to make sure that everyone can hear me and see me. Yeah? All yes, right. we can. Good. Well, it's always a pleasure to share the wonderful things that we do in our friendship place. As Chris mentioned, my name is David Vicenti. I'm the division director for AIM Higher, our employment program of the Metro DC area. So what I'm gonna do this afternoon, I'm gonna share the basics of what we do on a daily basis. And like Chris mentioned, please, please drop your questions in the chat and we'll do the best to answer them. And we'll give you also great news, uh, what is happening in the program of expansion because as you all know, the importance of employment in this society, extremely important, okay? Um, and one of the things that uh, I would like to share uh, to start off, uh, when I came to Friendship Place, I realized what a powerhouse and housing Friendship Place was already. I was extremely impressed, site visiting La Casa, site visiting different divisions, but I'll be truly honest, this was almost uh, four and a half years ago. I was a little disappointed about the employment. I call AIM Higher back in the day, and when I always mention this, the executive team laugh because it's funny. Back in the day, I used to call AIM Higher the child left behind. However, not anymore. We are becoming a powerhouse in employment in the Metro DC area. I must say, that because of the work of my coworkers, we are making this dream a reality. And we know how different populations, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a five-year vision that AIM Higher has in place that needs specialized assistance, right? To help them get jobs. But what do AIM Higher does? I'll, I'll, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very basic guy. So I'm gonna talk very simple, very simple. AIM Hire operates under a job first model. What is a job first model? Plain and simple. We believe, the model believes that anyone that walks through the door of AIM Hire, they already have a set of skills that they can get a job, not necessarily a career job, okay? But they can get a job to get going, okay? To put some food on the table, to help with rent, to help with their families. That's in a nutshell. We also operate under the person center approach, which means each individual is unique. So we help them based on the needs that they have for employment individually, okay? That's just to start off right away. 
Under aim higher, we have different programs, okay? Different programs, and I go a little, a little, a little bit of each of the programs. Right now, we have a grant under the Department of Labor going for two years. It's a three-year grant that is called HVRP, Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program. This team of professionals, my coworkers, we have two employment specialists, one job, job developer and outreach specialist, and myself. We assist homeless veterans or at risk of being homeless to obtain employment and or training. Unbelievable program, great program, great partnership with the Department of Labor. We have a second program, which I must say, uh, I, 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 I'm very proud of this because we are one of the two organizations that was granted this pilot program. And DC has been the first area in the whole nation adapting these, this uh, model, job first model in the government level, by the way. So with the help of, by the way, she's here, Lynn Amano and many different executive uh, members of Friendship Place, we secure uh, almost a year ago, a pilot program under the Department of Employment Services, which is the agency, employment agency with DC government, uh, which the grant officially is called Job for DC Job First Pilot Program. And that program is to assist DC residents to gain full-time employment, okay? Um, we have a team of two employment specialists leading that and uh, assistant director, Richard McKee, doing the administrative work on that. Very exciting program, which by the way, uh, Chris is gonna drop a link in a few minutes uh, because yesterday our assistant director, AIM Higher Assistant Director, Richard McKee testified uh, in front of council virtually about the greatness of this partnership with DOES and that we already have met the goal, okay? We are ahead two months, all right? In, unbelievable, awesome work. Uh, and uh, of course, we are making a big pitch to extend this grant and perhaps expand the team because we have uh, showed, right, with results, the great partnership we can have with DC government. Now, a second uh, pot of money that we're working with, it was a great, great donation and a great work, by the way. And I'm, I have to say, I have to say this as a side note, I don't know how development does it in Friendship Place. Unbelievable. Yesterday, let me tell you this. Yesterday, I was talking to a friend uh, because I'm doing other things at my church to, to do fundraisers, right? I was talking to a friend and I was telling him about the wonderful gala that we had a couple months ago. And he said, what? Oh, my God. How did that people do it? It's like, man, I don't know. They're just awesome. Um, but development. And we have found uh, probably like over a year ago uh, through the Bessels Fund Foundation, we got uh, 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 funds to assist homeless families to obtain employment. And for that program, we have one employment specialist working uh, to assist homeless families obtain employment, all right? Then we have what we call the core services or it also can be called the general services. That's what I call the program that if a participant does not fall in the category of HVRP or job or the DC job first pilot program or the families, hey, no worries. The core services can help you find a job. And that's the beauty about in hire. It's almost impossible to tell a participant we cannot help you because if they don't qualify for any of the programs, they automatically qualify for the core services because they can assist someone get a job anywhere in the Metro DC area. And that um, department is head by our senior employment specialist, Ebony, Ebony Paisley, and also supervised our assistant director, Richard McKee. Now, I wanted to give a little overview of the program, of course, uh, it's way more details, but keep in mind that each employment specialist, when they meet a participant, they develop an individual employment plan based on the job they want to get in the next 90 days. Why 90 days is so important? Because remember, this is a job first model, uh, job first model, which means to get you a job, to get you going. And let me tell you a quick story, very interesting and funny story, actually. When I interview for this position, 
almost four and a half years ago, they asked me the question. I remember JM was there and other uh, staff no longer with us, but they asked me the question, hey, David, um, do you know anything about the job first model? I never heard of it, truly honest. I say, but I have learned that when I don't know something, I just respond, no, I have not. However, I'm willing to learn. That was my response. So they explained to me the job first model. And I say, hold on. I have never heard the terminology job first model, but I lived the job first model. And I told them my story. Uh, many years ago, I used to live in my car in Baltimore. And I remember I was looking for a job in my career workforce. I was working as a cashier in Sports Authority, which is no longer in business. And I was also working as a server in Don Pablo's, which is a Tex-Mex uh, Mexican restaurant. So I had two part times working in things that, you know, were not related to my career. But at the same time, I was looking for my career job. And without me knowing, this is, this is awesome, without me knowing, I was being part of the job first model in my own life experience. So that's why I'm so passionate about it, because it works. It puts money, uh, you know, so it can help people get jobs, definitely. So employment specialists develop this individual employment plan, and they listen to the participant of the needs they have and able to get a job. And I'm just going to give you a few examples, because there's so many great things that we're doing. Let me give you an example. Let's say that one of our participants has an interview lined up. They don't have money for transportation. We can set up the transportation for that interview, whether it's Metro, whether it's, there's no Metro accessibility, we can do Uber. You know, uh, Let's say one of our participants, they don't have a cell phone. Hey, you all know, if you don't have a cell phone these days, are you human? Come on. I mean, you need a cell phone to get calls for interviews. We can set them up with a cell phone. And I'm going to go, I can go on and on and on. Anything and everything you can think of that could be a barrier of getting a job that perhaps for us, like, you know, it's nothing like we already have it, you know, uh, and we don't think about it, we can do it. Let me give you another example, uh, a prime example. And this just happened a couple of months ago with a participant HVRP. He got a job offer okay, with a contract, a Navy contractor, okay, to work on a boat. Yes, as you hear this, overseas. But guess what? The training was in Norfolk, Virginia. The participant had no money to get there. We, we uh, used funding to get him to Norfolk. As we speak, he's finishing the training, and he's going to start the job in a couple of weeks on a boat, okay? That's what he wanted. That's what he get. And again, that's what we do in a nutshell. Now, when a participant gets a job, we do something that I think is great. We do retention services. Every three, six, nine, and 12 months, we reach out to the participant to see how they're doing. How's your job going? Is there anything that you need? It could be that they're doing great in their job, that they're happy. Uh, but let's say that they need some working boots. We can do that. That's, that's, that's part of the retention services. Let's say the person's not happy with their job or they need a second job. The employment specialist can, what, help them with that as well. Okay, very important. So we keep track of that mainly to see if they need assistance with something else. And I'm gonna, I want to touch this because actually I was thinking about it before going into this uh, 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 call, that because someone does not retain a job, it doesn't mean it was unsuccessful. As you know, especially these days, okay, changing jobs is very, very common, okay? And I will say 90% of the time when someone does not want to be there anymore, it's because the pay is not enough or the treatment is not right, and it can happen, you know? It can happen for many, many reasons. However, we keep track of the retention percentages, right? So that way we can have uh, uh, that data as well. And as we speak, approximately anywhere from 65 to 75% of our participants retain their jobs in any of the intervals 
which I think is awesome. Definitely, it's awesome. So we provide that retention services. Now, another question I get sometimes is, well, how you how you foster relationship with employers to hire your participants? Well, we have great staff. Uh, one of the job duties of Richard McKee, our assistant director, is job development. And we have Catherine McCoy, which is a job developer for the HPAB program. But, you know, a lot of those contacts can also cross references, definitely. And then contacts that I made in the community as well uh, with employers. We, as we speak, there is a hiring fair right now going on on U Street in our office, all right, uh, for a, a landscaping company called Four Seasons. We do at least one hiring fair. Hear me out. Hiring fair. And this is another story I can tell you. I remember when I first got to aim higher, Richard McKee was there at the time he was a job developer. And he sat down with me and said, hey, David, I have a question for you. What do you think about job fairs? And me being a job developer in the past, I've been an employment specialist, I've been a job coach. So, you know, I, I know the trenches. And I look at him in the eyes and say, do you really want my true, truly honest opinion, Richard? Say, yes, please, yes, yes. I think they suck most of the time, 90% of the time. I'm not saying all of them, okay? But the reason why I think is because you go to a job fair and 90% of the employers, not all of them, okay? It's just go to this website, do this, do that, you know? And then I'm like, come on, you know, that's something I can do on my own. Think about it. Are participants struggling for transportation? traveling all the way from Southeast to Northwest, that's a big deal for them. So, so you can tell me to go to a website. So we came up with the idea of hiring fairs, committing an employer that at least a verbal, a verbal, I wanna hire you. Of course, pending processes, right? As you know, there's a lot of HR processes, but that's something that we pride ourselves, pride ourselves of that because it's something that is working and it will continue working. And by the way, by the way, uh, we are organizing in June, we'll keep you posted definitely, uh, a recognition activity for our employers to recognize the employers are committed to our organization. We wanna recognize them in a very nice dinner. Uh, we'll keep you posted, it's gonna be in June. And we also gonna have success stories um, uh, that day as well, participants that will share their success stories uh, with those employers, okay? So the, the aspect, the partnership of employer with employers are extremely important. I always tell anyone in these meetings, if you know any employer, hey, shoot me an email, which I'm going to put my email in a minute. Any contacts, yes, give me my information. You never know. It could be small business, medium business, big business. It doesn't matter. You just never know. Definitely. That's very important. And of course, our other partnership is our local government, you know, and federal government, because we're looking into expanding not only under uh, government grants, but also we are we're our own funding. And that's something that, you know, we, we, we're starting the talks of how we can do our own revenue to expand even more, you know, uh, and, and establish more programs. Aim Higher has a five-year vision. And this five-year vision includes teams of employment specialists that can help senior citizens get jobs. Isn't that exciting? A team that can help illegal immigrants or, or, or uh, get jobs. You know, that's a big deal. You know, you go to Home Depot, you go to Lowe's, you got these day laborers on the corner trying to cash a job. And, and most of these people, they don't get paid, you know? Uh, which, by the way, way, I tip off my hat to La Casa, which uh, uh, Casa of Maryland. I'm sorry, Casa of Maryland, which is a great organization that work with day laborers. They have a great system um, to expand our program to work with the LGBTQ community to help them find jobs as well. You know, uh, programs to help the mental and or disabled. Uh, participants to get jobs as well. So we have all these ideas, but guess what? Money, money, money. We need money, right? Because we need the staff to help 
these participants. So we're working very hard, not only to find grants, but also uh, how to make our own revenue, private funding, uh, to we can serve those populations as well. Okay, so this is Aim Higher in a nutshell. And just to let you know, uh, our fiscal year started October 1st of last year, and we have a goal of 245 job placements for the whole fiscal year, which ends September 30th of this year. Of course, as you can imagine, each program has specific goals, and each of us actually, as team members of Aim Higher, has specific goals related to the macro goal. But as we speak, I must report that we have placed 75 people into employment with an average of $17.92, okay? And that's a great, great effort uh, of the whole AIM Hire uh, team, uh, the work they do in and out with the participants. And I'm so proud of AIM Hire. I'm so proud and I see how AIM Hire will continue to grow definitely uh, in the near future as we speak to help more and more people get jobs with different needs that they have. So this is Aim Higher in a nutshell. I'm pretty sure people might have questions. I don't know if someone has dropped questions in the chat, but meanwhile, um, I'm gonna put my contact information, my email, anyone can feel free. By the way, we always need volunteers. Volunteers to help with resume, volunteer for the front desk in our physical office, volunteers to help people fill out uh, job applications online, uh, to e uh, set them up with emails. By the way, we have a closing closet. So if you have good interview clothes that is doing nothing in your closet, you know, reach out. We can definitely, uh, you know, look into that. Uh, donations, for example, we got eight, eight laptops donated. That was wonderful because that we can utilize for participants that need it. Always, always, um, uh, we can provide information of updates. Uh, we do a yearly summary, which is available. Anyone that wants that over last fiscal year, a summary of aim higher accomplishments and barriers and um, goals for the following year, I can definitely email it. Uh, I'll put my email here. Anyone wants any information, you can email me, okay? Because I know my a few of you might be interested, but any of you can email me uh, with information. So let me put my email here while Chris looks at the chat. Well, very good, David. Thank you so much. I mean, it's so informative. So, and just such an energizing program. It's you know, you know we we often say you know, Friendship Place is an organization that we provide housing. Yes, we provide jobs and we provide food and clothing, but above all, we provide hope. And Aim Higher really is the epitome of that. I mean, you you talk to what you all are doing, you talk to those who come through the Aim Higher program, and you just see such hope coming out on the other end, which is wonderful. Um, I see that uh, Rich Lehman has your, his hand up. Susan, I see you put yourself on camera. I don't know if you intended to ask a question, but we'll let Rich go first. And then if you've got a question, Susan, we'll go to you. But by all means, everyone else put questions in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, and like I said, I've got questions in case we uh, run out of questions from you. Rich, go to you first. Thanks, Chris. Um, and th thanks for that great summary, David. I'm, I was interested um, across your the three programs you identified with the, the veterans, the DC residents, the homeless families, I guess four, and, and the core services, um, how you come in contact with your clients, whether you go out and seek them, whether they come to you, they, they, um, how, um, how do they cross your doorstep? And um, and what are the various ways you go about identifying them? Yes, definitely. Uh, we have many ways. Uh, one of them we have created throughout the community um, relationship with community-based organizations that assist these particular uh, participants. That's one. Uh, we have became, I guess, so popular <laughs> that people refer participant to us uh, via email, and also they do walk-ins as well on Wednesdays that we have our orientation. We also have a virtual orientation, definitely. But we have established such a great rapport in the community with other community-based organizations 
And also, by the way, internally with our divisions, you know, uh, um, that um, that's how we, that's pretty much how we get uh, the, the participants. And one thing I have noticed throughout the years in my more than two decades doing workforce is that the word spreads really quick. Hey, they can help you find a job. Boom, boom, boom. And, you know, and hey, who referred you? Oh, my friend told me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's just uh, the main ways that we um, outreach uh, to get participants to help them find jobs. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Barbara Franklin, you uh, had your hand up, and I'm going to answer a question from Emily Novick uh, after Barbara. Well, I have a bunch of questions, and I don't want to uh, <laughs> uh, ask too many at, at once. Uh, I couldn't keep track of, of how many employees are now working with directly with AIM Higher. Uh, I, I saw with the pilot program, you have two employee employment specialists, plus, I guess, Richard. Um, mm -hmm. Can you uh, sort of sum those up for me so sure. I, I get a sense of that? And then a totally different question, and then I'll I'll save yeah. some to for later. Um, sure. How how are you doing with getting jobs for returning citizens? Uh, that that must be hard. Yeah. Right now we have two employment specialists with HVRP, and then we have a job developer and outreach specialist position. So that that person divides fifty percent job development. 50% outreach specialist. And then I oversee that program. Then in the family fund, we only have one employment specialist. And then for Job First, we have Job First DC pilot program. We have two employment specialists. And Richard, the assistant director, he oversees that program. And then for core services, which is general public, anyone that's not qualified for any of the programs, that person helps. It's a senior employment specialist, and then Richard oversees that program, and I oversee the families program. I'm still a little confused. So the senior employment specialist, uh, uh, her name was Ebony, is that correct? All right. And Richard, so they're the two, are they the sort of two at the top under you, and then you have what, one, three, four, five employment specialists under them? No. Um, let me let me resume it really quick. For the HVRP program, there's two employment specialists and one job development and outreach specialist. That's three staff right there. Uh huh. For families, only one staff, which is an employment specialist. Mm -hmm. For the Job First DC pilot program, there's two employment specialists, and then for the general public or core services, one senior employment specialist. I supervise directly the HVRP and the families, and Richard supervises directly the Job First DC pilot program and the general core services program. And of course, I oversee the whole department, the division. So there are five employment specialists, plus Richard, plus Ebony, plus a job developer. There's six. Oh, there's six. Okay. Six yes, employment specialists. And are they all full-time? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. And we don't have enough, truly honest. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, and I, I asked about the returning yeah. citizens. So your question was, how do we assist returning citizens get jobs? Yeah. We get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. And the way we do it is no different of any other person, truly honest. The biggest challenge that we see with returning citizens is that they believe 70, 80% of them that this is this is it for them, they're doomed. They can never, never, ever, ever get a job. And 70, 80% 80, 80 of the time is to get them ready uh, mentally that this is a numbers game and we have to apply for jobs until we find an employer that can hire you and appreciate you as a person that you are now and not as a person that you were in the past. There's no magic wand on this. Um, if you ask me on a personal level, I think it's ridiculous having someone that comes out as a returning citizen. This is a personal level. Um, and they have to pay for the rest of the life for that. It's, it's ridiculous. This makes no, no sense. But the challenge we have is um, policy and procedures of each company that is different. And the nature 
of the conviction and the nature of the job. So for example, as professionals in workforce, if we have someone that the nature of their crime was with a child, we will not <laughs> uh, look into at all uh, with jobs related to children. That's something that is identifying the IEP, Individual Employment Plan, definitely. Mm -hmm. Do you have to disclose, I can't remember the law in the various jurisdictions, do you have to disclose or do they have to disclose to the hiring companies? Not at all. Actually, it's against the law. That's it's right. Asking an interview. It's against the law in D.C., I, I know. Yeah, it's so. against the law. Now, now, um, if they are close to an offer, right, uh, the candidate can be open about it, right? about it, definitely. But one of the things that we try our best to do about it, because this is a very line, fine line, as you all know, there's a very great line there. The best we do is asking the employer, what are the things that you look into in the background check? You know, So that way we don't put this person through the process, the participant, you see? Because if we already know, let's say, this is just an example, the employer said, well, the person, if they have a felony in the last five years, we don't hire, no matter what. Okay. And then let's say we have someone with a felony in the last three years. There's no point of applying for that job, right? But that's that's the fine line right there. Employers, most of the time, they're not open about it. Now, one of the, one of the areas that we want to focus on in the five-year vision in hires to have a team specializing in, in getting returning citizen jobs. Why specialized team? Because we have to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are employers, uh, small, medium-sized businesses that are owned by returning citizens, and that's way easier. They don't care if whatever you did in the past, mm -hmm. they hire you if you have the skills, you see? Uh -huh. But then, you know, it's like finding a needle in the haystack, those employers, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to follow yeah, up on yeah, I want to follow up on Barbara's question. Do you find more employers are open to the idea of hiring uh, returning citizens or people being more yeah, open to that idea? Or is it still a struggle, you think, philosophically for an employer? Sorry, I was reading the chat and I was not <laughs> listening. I was here. <laughs> I was at, no, no worries. I was asking, do you find that employers are more open now to hiring returning citizens or is it still for many employers just a red line. I mean, and as you see, I'm 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 sitting up. <laughs> I find it equal. Mm -hmm. And there's two plus decades I've been doing this. Once again, I find it ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There's no other word. I find it shameful how our government and society and policies are against returning citizens. They are because. Once again, you're out, you, you did what you did, right? Even though you went to school in prison, great behavior, you have that label, not fair. It makes no sense. It's a challenge always, Chris. It's a challenge. The employers can say whatever they want. Yes, we do. It's not what you say, it's what is in policy. That's the tricky part. Mm -hmm. That's why the specialized team we want to build for returning citizens, they're going to focus mainly, once we have the team, of course, you know, we need the funding first, mainly on employers that are owned by returning citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, I don't know if some of you uh, consume this bread. It's called killer bread. I think they're out in the Midwest. Awesome bread. The, for me, the best bread ever. It's so <laughs> freaking good. It's called killer bread. If you like bread, buy it owned by a returning citizen unbelievable company they don't care what you did in the past da, 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 da. they hire you you see what i'm saying and that's what we need we need to have a great cohort of employers that owned by returning citizen that's for me that's the only immediate solution i can see mm -hmm. for me very good well thank you um I want to jump back up, Emily. You would ask a question in a little more detail about the uh, professional clothing. Uh, David, can you speak a little bit to what sort of clothing you're looking for? Um, yeah. And I'll answer part of her question. You know, we do accept some clothing at Calvert. Um, I don't know, David, whether you're open to uh, receiving the clothing directly at U Street. 
Yeah. Uh, and I've been spoken to Chris Kennedy about that, so I can't speak for him here. But I'll let you answer that question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I see a couple of people here put in the chat. Mike Killerbread. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> it's a great story. It's a great story. I encourage you to read about it. Um, well, sometimes our closing closet is empty and we need stuff, and sometimes it's overwhelming. You know, I like to be very transparent. So the best way to do this, you can write me an email directly um, and we can see if we are in need or not. Um, and then I can say yes or no, truly honest. Um, because for example, <laughs> throughout the pandemic and Chris can piggyback on this, we have so many people, I guess that they had nothing to do at home <laughs> and they were cleaning around and we had to say a lot of no's, truly honest. So, um, it's hard to tell, you know, it's, it's, it's week by week, truly honest, week by week. Very good. Uh, yeah. Other other questions before I ask some of my own questions. Does anyone else have a question? Sure. I don't want to in interrupt anybody else or just raise your hand. All right, I'll go ahead with mine. Uh, so, um, David, you what are some of like the current hot fields? I mean, are there certain industries that are more are, are hotter right now in terms of hiring? Always customer service, hospitality. Um, it also depends. It's by seasons. Like, for example, right now mm -hmm. we're doing a hiring fair with Four Seasons, a landscaping company, because they're gearing up for the spring, you know, um, definitely. Um, there's a few IT, uh, like basic IT help desk jobs uh, working from home um as well and working also with staffing agencies you know that they're pretty quick solutions for people that need a job in the next 90 days or so i will say around that you know definitely mm -hmm. and do you see what do you see in the offing in the horizon as an up-and-coming field i mean are there are there industries that you just can easily imagine that two or five years from now this is going to be someplace that really is going to be needing the people we serve? Well, as, as you see all these big companies growing and pretty much uh, burying small companies like Amazon, you know, Amazon is just, it's here to stay, you know. Um, you see a lot of all these warehouses, jobs, you know, that they run a 24 seven. But you also have to keep in mind that a lot of these, not a lot, most of these huge companies, they use a lot of artificial intelligence. But this artificial intelligence Someone got to fix these machines. I see that as a big, big, big growth in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So, you know, I don't think it's rocket science. Uh, I'm pretty sure more and more training is going to be in the AI, AI field that our participants can be part of, already lined up with employers. Like, for example, right now, we have a great partnership uh, with a DC organization it's called DCSEU actually our best partnership, and they train uh, participants as a six-month training of how to fix solar panels, mm -hmm. anything related with solar or with homes, and they're already lined up. They get paid going through the training and already lined up with an employer. And uh, there's not even one participant that's been turned down because if they you know, graduate successfully, they know how to do it. I see this model happening with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence sounds uh, maybe for some of us intimidating the term, but it's you know it, it's not it's really not. So mm -hmm. I see that area growing and growing more and more and more definitely. What about what about the green jobs you mentioned? The solar panels is that an industry a green, a green jobs that you think there will be a lot of growth in the coming years? Yeah, oh yeah, you see more Teslas on the road, more hybrids, more electric. You know, it's 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 a given. You know, it's a given that gas is going to disappear pretty much fossils. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. I don't think, and again, I might be completely wrong, but I don't think any of those jobs, you know, require more than a high school diploma. You know, it's just a specialized vocational training, right? Mm -hmm. And hey, if a job like that can give you, get, get you paid 25, $30 an hour. That's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. you can do a career there, you know, right. definitely. And what about, you know, we see, you see so much in the paper, in the news about the gig economy. So people driving Uber or driving Uber Eats or DoorDash, is that something where some of our folks are going to or taking advantage of, or is that? 
I don't know the percentages of our participants that do that, but we do have them, by the way. And you know what? You touch a very good point because one of the areas that uh, it would be great for Aim Higher to expand is an entrepreneurship area. Mm -hmm. More and more people are self-employed. They want to work on their own, period. Um, this pandemic, what I think personally, it, it, it put us ahead of time of what's going to happen in the last 20 years. You know, it put us ahead of time. It was, this was going to happen employment wise, but the pandemic just put it ahead of time. Many people thinking about, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? You know, I'm a great baker. People tell me my sweets and goodies are great. You know what? I got to do this leap of faith and it's happening. It's happening. That's why it's so hard to hire. Friendship Place is going through the struggle, you know, uh, hiring people because people, the, 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 the workforce right now is in the side of the job seeker. Before the pandemic, it was in the side of the employer. People are very picky, but not because of the heck of picky, because their priorities now are different. You know, having more time, quality time with their family. They rather make a little bit less money, but being with their kids, you know, hey, I can bake at home, make good living uh, and be with my kids. So, you know, priorities are shifted uh, my personal opinion, enormously, definitely. And with this uh, new generation, 20, 30 year old uh, generation, you know, you, you put a uh, hundred kids, 20 to 25, 30 years old in a whole room and then you tell them, you know, do you see yourself doing the job you do 50 years? I'll, I'll guarantee you 99.9 say no. So I think self-employment and entrepreneurship should be an area that we should also look into because for me, as long as you're happy and making the income you want to do, that is success. You know, we, we, and, and let me back this up. And, and I know most of you have thought this because I used to think like this. We think success is only going to college, getting a good job, career, career job, you know, making it and that's it. No, you know, there's people that they're happy and successful being a plumber. They're happy and successful working Uber full time. They're happy and successful during their own baking goods, their own self-employed business. So I think we need to shift more and more and more of what we want for them. No, it's what they want. You know, that's why I have a problem. I do have a problem when uh, certain grants, and I'm not going to mention, uh, or certain private institutions want to imply things into people. No, you know, it's what people want and they need and for the life that they want now. That's a total different topic. Don't get me going, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, as we talk about entrepreneurship, you know, much much of what you all do at Aim Hire or provide people with the skills they need in order to get into the workforce. What are some of the different skills you think that would be necessary for our participants to learn to be a successful to, to be successful as a, someone who is self-employed or entrepreneurial? What are some of those tools they would yeah. need? Yeah. That's a great question. I don't have the whole answer, but of course, it really depends the industry they want to get into. Because mm -hmm. of course, if you are self-employed with Uber or DoorDash, you pretty much need a phone and, and a car, right? That's pretty mm -hmm. much it. You don't need nothing else. And then of course, when tax season comes, you got to just do your taxes. But you know, if you're into that, you want to be a baker, have your own restaurant, you know, that that's totally different. Uh, conversation about permits and all that great stuff, definitely. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't have an answer, truly honest, because we don't do it. I'm just, you know, saying uh, what I've seen and I heard, definitely. But I think it will be a great program for people that are seriously about it. You know, um, I think so. But I think it will be, I think it will be more beneficial. Uh, the self-employed uh, without. Re the self-employed that is not like the, the the businesses that don't require like actual building employee, you know, like 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 working from home type of deal. Working from home meaning like you're doing your Uber, DoorDash, and why not? And there's many other platforms that do this, like Amazon. I know they have a program you can buy buy a truck and work for Amazon like a franchise, you know, like a franchise, you know. So again, you know, uh, it really depends, I guess, the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess it really depends. And I know there are places out there with tools like that. I know AARP, for example, had been doing a lot uh, building entrepreneurial skills for older adults uh, and you know, 
So I'm sure there's things we're going to learn as we go forward. Susan, you had your hand up. Yes, um, David, you mentioned AI <clears throat> as a place where people might actually be able to get jobs. But I was just reading in the post um, this weekend, I think, about how employers are using AI to screen the applicants that come in on online. And that that therefore is now kicking out even more people who are applying online because there's such rigidity with the requirements that they've set and what language they want to see in those applications. And it's a computer that's reading them. Um, are, are folks not really doing a lot in terms of getting jobs online through websites and you're doing more trying to find the employers and then match them up? Is that how this works? I will say 60 to 65 percent. The last you said, you know, the actual face to face matching the employer. Uh, but the other percentage, you know, you have to I mean, there's no way around it. Online application is here to stay. Uh, but one of the things that's why the employment specialists and the volunteers are committed to this. They're so committed of uh, emphasizing uh, using keywords in the job descriptions for these applications. You know, these scanners, which I know what you're talking about. Uh, I used to work in Johns Hopkins many years ago in their career center. And Johns Hopkins use, utilizes that system. You know, they get thousands a day. You know, there's no way around it. And huge companies, they use this system. There's no way around it. I don't think medium companies do or even small, you know, but uh, one of the things that we coach is how to utilize those keywords and those job descriptions to plug it into the application and or your resume. So the probability once they get scanned by these, you know, systems, um, you get called for the interview. So it's really learning how to work the system and you and yes. figure out what those languages are. Cool. Which, by the way, Chris, I remember a story about self-employed or entrepreneurship. This was like probably my second year in Aim Higher. We had a gentleman that he used to sing on the Metro karaoke with his guitar. Um, we, I don't know where he is, truly honest. Uh, but um, he was struggling because his mic broke. And we were able to buy him a mic for his karaoke so he can continue earning his money. And hey, that's a job placement because he's making money and he's happy. That's what he likes to do. You see, so that's a prime example. Mm -hmm. You see, prime example of what people want and makes them happy. Not necessarily everyone wants an $80,000 car and a half a million dollar home. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, it, you know, again, uh, I just I just remember that story, Chris. I wanted to tell it to everyone. Oh, fantastic. Um, other before I ask you my next question, do other folks have any questions they want to raise their hand for or put it in the chat? I think Lena Mano uh, share a link about Dave Killerbread. <laughs> Dave Killerbread. <laughs> I guess we get a I, I guess we get a, a free promo. Uh, I don't know if we can reach out, Chris, to get a, some right, money I, from them. But let me I tell you. I want to if they're in the show. metro DC area, we'll definitely contact them to hire <laughs> returning citizens. But I think there are in Oregon or something like that. I'm not sure, but yeah. Well, I, one question I do want to ask you: We we talked about you know the ch specific challenges facing returning citizens. What? But you mentioned older adults uh, uh, before. Um, you know, we know that age discrimination is still a thing. Oh yeah. Um, and and how do you? Well, first of all, do you do you get many participants who fit that category who are older adults or and, and how do you overcome that? To answer that question, actually, uh, yesterday I was looking at some data. The average age of our participants is just average. It's anywhere from 48 to 58. That's average. Oh. So, so that's right in that spot where people would run. into. Yeah, that exactly. That's average. Definitely. But, you know, you touch a very good point because there's something that I like to call hidden discrimination. Mm -hmm. And that's the tricky part that is hidden. An employer can say, yes, we do this. Yes, we do this. Yes, we do this. And then when you start sending qualified participants magically or whatever the word you want to use, they're not even getting interviews, mm -hmm. you know? So it's hard to tell, but yes, I mean, it is obvious that there is this hidden discrimination, whether because of age, whether because of race, whether because, you know, their background, why not, you know, and it's sad. That's why 
when we develop these partnerships with employer, which by the way, once we have everything set for this employer appreciation event, uh, we're gonna send you all the invite, which you're gonna be more than welcome. You're gonna notice that the employers who work with, they're very people person. They're very empathetic, sympathetic. You see, it's like they know what we, we're doing, right? So we, we, we focus on the quality of the relationship with these employers. I don't get impressed. Let me tell you, uh, I mean, I respect everyone. That's one of my life philosophy, but I admire whoever puts action into the words. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've seen when employers, and I always, you know, with my coworkers, when something happens with an employer, oh, tell them, let me tell you something, things happen. Like an employer say, yes, we're gonna be there. They don't show up and they come up with all these excuses. And then all of a sudden, you know, they disappear, you know? So, you know, again, I don't have time to waste. There's so many employers who really want to work with this population. But when we, when we market our program, we market as we have participants with qualified skills that your business can benefit from. We don't go to them and say, oh, please give him a job because they don't have one. No, no, no. We don't go. No, no. We understand they're running a business and we have what you need, the people power. Can we settle a good relationship uh, based in results, based on results? I'm not going to say the name of this company. It's very popular pharmacy. Oops, pharmacy. Um, <laughs> and they say they're going to do this. They're going to do that. Da, 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 da. And it was it was such a bad experience. And again, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And again, I don't know their agendas in corporate, right? But that's that our experience working with big companies, big corporation has not been good. And I'm not saying it's the fault of these recruiters or HR people. I'm pretty sure it's their policies, you know, their politics inside and why not? And, you know, it's sad because once again, all we want is to get people some income that they can have a better lifestyle. Fantastic. Barbara, you had your hand up. Uh, I'm just curious uh, if, if you know the statistics about the people that you're serving out of the, say, 75 that you found jobs for so far this year. Uh, how many were truly unhoused, uh, uh, living on the street, living in cars, living in shelters, or are are many of them at risk of uh, homelessness and uh, uh, fortunately still still uh, having some decent housing? How does it fit with some of the rest of uh, aim of uh, friendship places, populations, and work? I will say a good 60% from the top of my head, a good 60%, I will say so. Uh, but one of the things that we are fostering, and this is something that we have talked in the executive level with Friendship Place, fostering more and more and more how Friendship Place can work even more together within divisions. As you know, all the all the eight divisions, they're housing. They're pure housing, pretty much. Aim higher is just employment, you know? Um, how can we work even more together, people that are in the housing or looking for housing, that they need this job? And, and, and to answer your question from the top of my head, 60%, but I want to say this because this is going to sound, how can I say this? Well, let me just say it. <laughs> I guess by now all of you have know my style of, of, of who I am. I like to be very transparent, not beating around the bush. Friendship plays, in my personal opinion, and I have talked this with my chief uh, vice president of community solutions, Sean Reed, and many executive team. Friendship plays so far, from my personal opinion, their work has been phenomenal. Phenomenal. But I believe it can be extra phenomenal if we can dictate our own identity with our own funding. The funding that we have right now, which is most of them is government, had dictate the tempo of the organization. Mm -hmm. And it has been phenomenal. 
imagine, imagine, just imagine if we can create our own funding, more solid, way more we can do because we don't, we're, we're not tied up of all these fine prints and grants, which if any of you have worked with grants, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. So this is something that I have talked and I envision our organization to move forward in the next decade or so. So that way we can be even more open of how to work together. For example, right now, we have an employment goal as a division, aim higher, 245 job placements. But let me tell you a quick story. When I first got here, I told you I, I visited all the divisions, which I'm, I'm still extremely impressed. If you have not visited La Casa, if you not have not visited Valley Place, if you not have not visited the Brooks, do so. You will be extremely impressed. These buildings, they do not look like public assistance buildings at all. They look beautiful. And I was extremely impressed. So talking to my coworkers, fellow division directors, oh, so what do you do? This, oh yeah, housing, okay. And I asked them, well, once we help them get housing, uh, do we help them get a job? Oh no, we just help them housing. That's what the grant states, that's what we do. They're not doing nothing wrong, right? They're just following what? But just imagine this, imagine, imagine. And I've done, I done, uh, 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 a verbal uh, survey with division directors. Imagine having an internal goal of employment by division. By division. So let's say, for example, someone from neighbors first individuals. They have housing. Great. We help them. They're doing great. But this person, we promote and say, by the way, we have an employment program that will not affect your housing and can help you in many ways, not only financially, it can help you psychologically to be productive in society and blah, 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 blah. And let's say this person says, yeah, I wanna, I wanna do a part-time. I don't wanna be at home doing nothing. Well, I just don't wanna go, I, wanna, I don't wanna be in doctor's appointment and that's it. I wanna socialize, be productive in society. And we help them get a part-time job. Let me tell you something. Almost 70% of participants we have now in our housing programs, they want to get a job. Doesn't that tell you something? Sure. Doesn't that tell you something? So this is exciting because, and I mentioned this many times, we're sitting on a pot of gold and we don't even know it. But the key is how we create that internal culture within divisions, how to create that extra funding our own funding, so we're not tied up with all these fine prints and grants, right? I'm not saying we're gonna kick to the curb uh, government, no, not at all, it's great partnership, but we need to create our own identity and employment wise as, our, as a whole, because if we're phenomenal now, we're gonna be extra phenomenal with this, with this uh, strategy. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that just as, as a donor and a volunteer. Uh, I think Chris knows that I've, uh, I've always sort of stressed that we have to tell people with all these grants why we're coming for more uh, individual mm -hmm. uh, donations. And uh, I think it gets more and more important because the big programs are funded by grants and people wonder well, why do I need to give my hundred dollars or whatever? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm glad to hear you talking in those terms. I think uh, I think yeah. donors would be happy to know, and 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 they're happy to know it's all those other little things that the individual, the private funding, does Makes fund. Fun. But I don't. It it doesn't always come through. I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's why we have these events, right, Chris? Exactly so we can, right. Let we people can communicate know. it. Um, um, you know, um, again, any of you that wants the summary report for last fiscal year, aim higher last fiscal year, uh, email me. I'll be more than glad to share that. Definitely, even though we have some data in our website, which I already put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. But I think transparency creates trust, and trust creates that glue. And you just said that, Barbara. 
And, and you know, if I'm a donor, it's like, I want to know where these $100 went. Why not? You have the right, not because you donated the $100. No, because you're part of it. Us human beings, we're hungry to be part of something bigger than us. That's it. It's not because of the money. It's not because of the amount. And I understand that. You know, and that's why that's one of the things I'm very proud of Friendship Place, that we 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 provide that information. We can provide more information, definitely, so that donor can, you know, say, wow, I'm part of something bigger than I thought. And let me give you a prime example. I just, I just get so excited about this because this job for me is not a job. It's one of my life purposes. I have others. I'm not going to go over. But there is certain things that grants don't cover. Yeah. And that's where the private funding comes and kicks mm -hmm. in. It's amazing. This lady and the family and the family program, they remember the, the family program that we help a homeless family get jobs? She got a job as a CNA. She wow. didn't have not money to pay her car insurance. Mm -hmm. She needed her car to get to her job. The job offer is there. We have the letter. What did that mean? Happiness, financial stability, da 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 we were able to use private fund to pay for her car insurance for the whole year. You see? That's fantastic. So that's, that's something that cannot have been done with the grant money. And we understand that the grant says, well, you can do this. Okay, that's fine. But imagine if we did not have that private funding, that lady couldn't take the job. Right. Sadly. So let me tell you, and I'm not saying this because I'm here. I, I, I'm part of this mission of Friendship Place, and you're all here listening to me. But in my more than two decades working in the nonprofit sector, this is the organization that is so much organized than any other organization, you know, and it's amazing. It's amazing what they do. I, I'm telling you, I pray to God, Lord, give them what, wisdom, this and that, to development. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. <laughs> well, thank you. Anyway, I get excited. I don't want to take time. No, I appreciate it. And David, thank you for doing this. And everyone, thank you for being a part of it. We're uh, over time here. And just thank you, David. This is so inspirational. And just, to, you know, it, it's so moving to see the successes and, and to see what a difference we make in people's lives. And that's what we're all here for, not just those who are on this screen, but the, the staff at Friendship Place. That's what we come to work for every day is to make a difference in people's lives. So let me tell you how you can make a difference in people's lives. You can sign up for Friendship Place Walk. And I dropped the chat, uh, the website in the chat. It's three simple words, Friendship Place Walk, uh, that's singular, uh, at uh, .org. Um, please sign up, bring your friends, bring, create a team, bring your friends, sign up, show up that day. It is April the 29th. Um, it's just that you, many of you, I, I, I see who's on this call. Many of you have been there. There's just a great opportunity to show how much you care and help support this organization. And of course, if you know of any companies that might be able to provide sponsorship dollars towards the event, let us know because this is all so critical. David, thank you again for your time today. I know how busy you are and it is greatly appreciated. So a round of applause there. A pleasure. Um, we uh, will have another, oh, three weeks from now, we will have. Uh, a webinar on our LGBTQ work that will be March the 21st. Yes, that is three weeks from now. Uh, that'll be the topic of our next webinar, our LGBTQ work. Uh, Chris Kennedy, uh, Aurelia Lesh. Um, I'm forgetting somebody. I'm so sorry. Whoever it is I'm forgetting, I, I apologize. Uh, from before 30, Anyway, please come to that webinar. You'll see more information. We'll send out an email about it um, before. Scarlett Levy, thank you. That's how, that's who it was. Um, apologies, Scarlett, if you're watching this later. Um, please come to that and please come to the walk and be part of our work. And uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you later. I'm going to hit stop record now and uh, take care. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you, everyone.